Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. John, that was kind of a sexy opening there. I, I too know. sexy for you. Hey there. Hey, 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 hey there, there, Jim. It's, uh, hey there, Jim. It's, it scared me a little. I, I wonder what the audience is thinking right now. We're in two completely different places, everybody. We are. As God it, it, is my witness. It reminds me of my favorite impression that James Austin Johnson does. Okay, I got the perfect okay. one. This is Bob Dylan's cell phone on vibrate. Okay. <laughs> 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 I listened to a whole bunch of, uh, strangely, last night on YouTube, uh, a whole bunch of impressions of all kinds of things. But the funniest thing was... Kevin Pollack was talking about doing impressions. So uh, recently I learned how to do uh, Liam Neeson. Uh, Alan Arkin, who I do in, in my act, you know, he and his old, uh, youngest son, Tony, created a game called One Word Impressions. So you do an impersonation of someone, but you can only use one word to sell the entire impersonation. And here's the toughest part. You cannot use a word that person is famous for saying. Okay? That's cheating. So for Liam Neeson... The word is bananas. You all have uh, <laughs> familiar with the word. And Liam Neeson says that word like this. Bananas. <laughs> Honest to God, I laughed out loud because it was so perfectly laid in there with the right tone, the way, the right bananas. It was just... You know, sometimes you go down that YouTube rabbit hole and you just you don't know where you're going to end up. I started uh, by looking for one particular thing. And then the next thing that was in my queue was no one knows what Hitler's voice sounded like when he was just talking. We got plenty of recordings of him screaming, but no talking except this one. That's a secret. So listen to that. And of course, it's all in German. So after a, a sentence or two, I was like, yeah, OK. That's what he must have sounded like. What else you got? And then it was impressions after that. And I, I stayed with it and uh, laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. Is this uh, all ins insomnia driven? Uh, it was a little bit insomnia driven there last night. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, it happens sometimes even to the best of us. All right. Well, if anyone is still listening, uh, no, this is a, uh, season three, episode four. Before we dive into listening to this episode's story, I want to thank everybody for uh, filling out the survey results. That was uh, very nice. It was very nice they did that. We heard some uh, really nice things. There's a, I think, a surprising majority of thought as to how listeners would like us to move forward. The fact that they want us to move forward at all is also nice. Um, so barring any major life incidents, we are planning currently, Knockwood, uh, moving ahead with the season four, which will be the same, but different. Yeah, more so to we'll come have on that, I would think. Yes, more to come on that. In this episode, after our uh, Eli Mark short story, we're going to hear from Ken Weber uh, and a surprise guest talking about the right way to give and to get notes. He's the perfect guest for this episode because the story we're listening to from that eighth book in the Eli Mark series, The Self Working Trick, is the $100 gift certificate. And that story is all about the value of getting an outside perspective on your work which Eli gets in a slightly uh, surprising manner. Yeah. And following that, we're going to hear that chat with Ken Weber on his thoughts the right way, the wrong way to give and receive notes and a special surprise guest. Never happened before. Probably never happen again. Probably never happen again. Who? How does somebody drop in on a podcast? Well, you're going to find know. out after this. Without any further ado, here is the Eli Mark short story, the $100 gift certificate. <laughs> The $100 Gift Certificate I'm familiar with the sound made by the bell which hangs over our magic shop door. Not in a Pavlovian sort of way, of course. For a sound to produce a repeatable physical effect, like Pavlov and the chime he rang to get his dogs to salivate, there must be a minimum number of repetitions for the stimulus to occur. Our shop has simply never reached that necessary saturation point with the bell. To put it another way, the bell has never needed to be replaced, and likely never will. Let me put a positive spin on this situation. On those rare occasions when a customer walks through that door, 
they're unlikely to be disturbed by other customers during their shopping experience. Such was the case recently when a middle-aged man pushed the door open and stepped hesitantly into the shop. I glanced up at the sound of the bell. The man looked like he was coming in on a dare. His eyes darted around the space as if someone might be lurking in the shadows, ready to pounce on him. Instead, all he got was me. Good morning, I said, my voice cracking from lack of use. Can I help you find something today? This was my standard opening line with strangers, which were rare. Most people who came into Chicago Magic were either magicians or magic adjacent, or they were lost or wanted change for the bus. But new customers weren't frequently seen on the premises. This fact alone explains all you need to know about how well or not I was running the business. The gentleman didn't say anything, just approached the counter as he put a hand into his overcoat breast pocket. It seemed unlikely that he was reaching for a gun, but try telling that to my flight or fight instinct, which, to be honest, is always heavily weighted toward flight. I inhaled quickly, mapping out an escape route in my head, through the curtain, into the back of the shop, out the rear door, and run down the alley until I collapse. The necessity for this short-range travel plan disappeared the moment his hand came out of his coat. He was holding a white, letter-sized envelope. He fumbled it open and pulled out the single sheet of paper within. For a moment, I thought he might be a process server, and I was about to get a summons of some kind. To give you an idea of how bored I was at that moment, I found the prospect sort of exciting. He unfolded the sheet and handed it to me. Got this gift certificate from my coworkers, he said, his voice a flat monotone. Need to use it. I glanced down at the sheet he had handed me. It was, indeed, a gift certificate in the amount of $100. The Chicago Magic logo was at the top of the sheet, and my Uncle Harry's expansive signature was at the bottom. In between, a simple paragraph spelled out the specifications of the certificate, declaring the bearer was entitled to $100 worth of goods or services from Chicago Magic, applicable taxes not included. Harry had come up with the idea of gift certificates years ago and had the sheets printed up in full color on a nice paper stock. Since then, I think we've sold less than a dozen. I'm not sure if this was due to a lack of demand or poor marketing on our part. If history is any indicator, it was the latter. Fantastic, I said as I set the certificate down on the counter. What exactly are you looking for? He glared back at me. He was maybe in his mid-forties with a perpetual look on his face, which suggested that something nearby had produced an unpleasant odor. Flecks of gray were evident in his otherwise dark hair. No idea, he said flatly. Wasn't my idea in the first place. Don't really care for magic. This was a gift, I said as I picked up the sheet again. Yes, he said. Gift certificate. Didn't ask for it. Didn't want it. Now I'm stuck with it. Well, if you really don't want it, you don't have to use it, I suggested. You could return the certificate. It's not a standard procedure, but if you truly don't want it, I'd be happy to refund the money to you. Oh, that dog won't hunt, he said with a grim chuckle. It's not my money. It's their money. Plus, they're going to ask what I got with it, and I'll need a plausible response. So, what do you have here that's plausible? I was stumped. I've been asked all manner of questions over the years about our products, but the level of their plausibility, or even the existence of their plausibility, had never been raised before. Um, I stammered as I tried to structure an answer. Well, the store is divided into, I guess, what you would call several zones. The first and most general is, well, magic tricks. Those might range from trick coins all the way up to large-scale illusions, although the largest we have in the shop is an Okito checker cabinet, which I now remember we've sold, so that's not really an option. He stared at me. I soldiered on. Then we have your magic supplies, I guess you'd call them. 
decks of cards, silks, balloons, magic wands, that sort of thing. I might have been wrong, but I think he actually mumbled the word harumph. Anything else? he asked. Well, yes, I suppose so. We've got um, your gag gifts. Gag gifts, he repeated. Sure, you know, your fake dog vomit, your escorting lapel flower, your joy buzzers. He sniffed at the words. Juvenile. That's simply juvenile. I had to agree with him on that, and the thought of assembling $100 of those items was, in itself, a bit chilly. That purchase alone might empty the shelf entirely, which, on the whole, wasn't such a bad thought. Then we have, um, books and periodicals, I continued. My uncle had a large catalog of books when he ran the shop, and I've tried to keep up. So there's everything, from classics like The Expert at the Card Table, right up to current releases, including Harry's own two-volume career-spanning book. And we also have copies of lecture notes from a myriad of magicians over the years. And magazines, like Genie, Magic Magazine, Mum, The Sphinx, The Jinx. He peered over at the large bookcase, which took up nearly one wall. Those are just books about tricks? Magic tricks? Mostly. Some books cover specific tricks and routines. Others discuss magic theory and the principles of magic. We also have a few biographies and autobiographies. In fact, I think we even have a signed copy of Sandy Marshall's book, Beating a Dead Horse, The Life and Times of Jay Marshall, if you're interested. Well, I'm not. I see. I scanned the room. I landed on the posters stacked in the corner. Some of them were framed and leaned up against the wall. Others were loose and assembled in a hanging file contraption that Harry had put together. If you're a fan of ephemera, we've got promotional posters and playbills for magicians and their shows, some of which date back as far as 100 years, I think, I said. Not sure why I was continuing on this fool's errand. Magicians like Carter, Thurston, Blackstone Sr., and even a couple Houdini reprints. And somewhere I know Harry has an original Max Molini poster that he's probably willing to part with, but not for $100. As I spoke, I realized I was long overdue to do a complete inventory of the store's products. At this rate, I thought, I could mark that task as done. Is that all? I searched my brain as I scanned the store again. There had to be something here I could unload on this guy. There was nothing. Except me. Well, it's a bit below my standard rate, but I'd be happy to do a private show for you and your family and friends. Got no family. I assumed his response implied he at least had friends, but I didn't want to press that point. you show for your co-workers, then. The people who gave you the gift certificate. He shook his head. No, I don't think so. Doesn't sound interesting. At that moment, I could not agree with him more. Nothing seemed less interesting to me than performing for this fellow and the miscreants who had saddled him with this wholly unnecessary and frankly sort of mean spirited gift certificate. I felt I had exhausted all avenues and then one final thought occurred to me. Well, to fulfill the gift certificate, we could, if you're interested, use it to cover the cost of a lesson. A lesson? He repeated. You mean, like a magic lesson? I was going to make a crack about swimming lessons being an option as well, but thought better of it. He stared at me for a long moment. Is that all you have? Yes, I said. I think it is literally all that I have. He looked around the empty shop. If that's all you've got. Terrific. When would you like to schedule it? Now seems as good a time as any, he said. Doesn't look like you have much else going on. It was hard to argue with that. Yes, I suppose now's as good a time as any, I agreed. I said he could call me Eli and he said I could call him Mr. Caldwell, and we were off and running. Lessons were generally held in the back room, away from any possible prying eyes in the store. 
That, of course, wasn't currently a pressing issue, but I moved us to the table in the back more out of habit than anything. So, what are you looking for? I asked as I gestured to one of the two chairs. A little sleight of hand to do at a party? A card trick to amuse co-workers? Or something a little bit flashier? I don't want anything flashy, he snapped back, not looking to draw attention to myself. This was a challenge I had not faced in the few years I'd been giving lessons. I'd never encountered someone who wanted to learn magic, yet at the same time did not want to draw attention to themselves. Okay, I said slowly. You have a preference for card tricks, coin tricks, something with a phone or a Rubik's Cube? He stared back at me blankly as I listed those possible options. Don't like handling money he said. Dirty. You don't know where it's been. And I don't care for that cube thing. Silly waste of time. Well, that certainly helps narrow things down, I said, trying to put a smile in my voice. I think I failed. Card tricks are pretty universal. It's easy to carry a deck of cards with you, and there are plenty of tricks we can do spontaneously. Not a big fan of spontaneity. As my Uncle Harry was fond of saying, you could have knocked me over with a feather. So what do you do for a living? I asked, thinking this might open some doors to possible directions in which we might head, learning-wise. Insurance. Insurance, huh? That's what I said. So do you sell insurance, broker insurance, manage an insurance office? I said, quickly running out of possible job titles in the insurance business. I'm an actuary. Oh, a numbers guy. I said. Perhaps something with a magic square. That could be fun. Numbers aren't toys to be played with. He stared back at me. We engaged in a short game of eyeball chicken, and then I caved and looked away. Okay, I said, stretching the word out into three syllables. It was pretty clear this was not going to be a long-term teacher-student relationship. I realized the smart thing to do would be to teach him a couple simple tricks and be done with it. It was not as if I was training him for a competitive spot at FISM. Well, why don't I just show you a couple of different kinds of tricks and we'll see if you spark to anything. Fine. Seeing I wasn't likely to get a more enthusiastic response than that, I started with a simple version of the ambitious card, forgoing any theory and just jumping into the trick. I was about four moves in when he held up a finger to get my attention. Excuse me? I stopped in mid-move. Yes? Clearly, that wasn't the top card you just showed me, although you said it was. Am I supposed to believe you on that point? I mean, is that part of the trick? Am I supposed to be aware of that deception? His questions, rattled off in his near monotone, lacked criticism or judgment of any kind. He was simply seeking clarification. Um, no, you're supposed to think the card I showed you was the top card on the deck. Well, I didn't think that. It was clear to me it wasn't the top card. Are you sure you're doing it right? Again, there was no judgment in his tone, just a bare statement of facts. I was reminded of an ongoing grammatical battle I'd waged with Uncle Harry over the years, as he labored to teach me the difference between disinterested and uninterested. They're simply not the same thing, Harry would grumble. An uninterested person is bored or indifferent to what you're doing. A disinterested person is impartial. They have no stake in the outcome. A good referee would be disinterested. While I had often struggled with the distinction, this encounter with Mr. Caldwell was vividly driving home the difference between the two words. He was absolutely disinterested, and in the best way possible. I considered offering the excuse that it had been a while since I'd done the trick, true enough, and that I was likely a little rusty, absolutely the truth, but I felt this wasn't the time for a defensive posture. Instead, I backed up and performed that moment from the trick again. This repeated action received a slight shake of the head from my disinterested student. 
I did it three more times and finally got a blessed nod of approval. Yes, that time I believed it was the top card, he said. Fantastic, I said, relieved to have been given a passing grade. Let's move on. Actually, Mr. Caldwell said, once again holding up a single finger, there was an earlier moment which also failed the fool. I tightened my grip on the cards, which was nowhere near the relaxed handling the trick required. What would that be? That moment when you said you were putting that card into the middle of the deck, Caldwell said. His tone suggested he discovered a minor but annoying accounting error in some banal audit. It was clear to me the card wasn't being placed in the middle. Very clear, in fact. This was a move which had famously and repeatedly fooled Houdini, I thought. But no matter, it wasn't getting past the eagle-eyed Mr. Caldwell. Let's run through it again, then, I said, working hard to take the rising tension out of my voice. I performed that move four more times before finally getting the nod from my persnickety student. We continued the trick, and he only had one more point of criticism. If you wanted me to believe that you've actually cut the cards, I'm afraid you've fallen short of your goal, which we were able to smooth over with only two repetitions of the action. So, that's the trick, I said, once we finally reached the conclusion. It had felt like a very long journey indeed. Would it be possible to see it again? Caldwell asked. This request was delivered in his same flat tone. You're in charge, I said. I dutifully began the trick again from the top, and wouldn't you know it, the darndest thing happened. As I went through the moves, I realized the trick was now, I don't know, better. The small alterations I'd made based on his comments had actually improved the flow of the illusion. Not only was it more deceptive, but it also simply felt better in my hands. I got to the end and couldn't help but smile. I looked up at Mr. Caldwell, who merely stared back at me blankly. Well, that's the trick, I finally said. I handed the cards to him. Shall I start teaching you the moves? Caldwell scooted back, apparently repelled by the cards. Oh, goodness, no, he said. That's not for me. Show me something else. I was surprised by this reaction, but probably shouldn't have been. It was pretty much in keeping with the attitude he'd had since he walked into the store. He clearly was not what you'd call a magic guy. Well, how about I show you something with coins? Of course, you wouldn't have to handle them, I quickly added. With that proviso, then, certainly, he said, still registering zero excitement at the proposal. This is a variation on a coin matrix made famous by David Roth, I said, as I pulled four Kennedy half dollars from the coin purse in my pocket. I recognized the trick was by no means suitable for a beginning magic student. However, it was something I'd been working on, and it needed an audience. And if nothing else, Mr. Caldwell was proving to be an ideal spectator for magic. For the sake of clarity, why don't I do the trick all the way through once, I suggested, as I placed the four coins on a close-up mat I'd added to the table. And then we can address any comments or questions you might have. Fine, was all he said, as he patiently waited for me to begin the routine. I wouldn't call what I did next flawless, but it wasn't bad. I'd done Al Schneider's version of Matrix for years, using playing cards to cover the coins and reveal their various movements. But doing it barehanded was a new experience for me. I got to the end of the routine and looked over at Mr. Caldwell. He stared down at the four coins, which were now all assembled in a small pile on one corner of the close-up mat. He looked up at me. I have some notes, was all he said. This was the understatement to end all understatements. There are maybe seven or eight moves in the short routine. He had thoughts on every single one of them, 
and even had some choice comments on several moments which occurred between the moves. We went through the routine again, move by move. It was both a painful and productive experience. He questioned every step I took, asking why I did it this way, and wouldn't it be better if I did it that way? And isn't it obvious what you're doing there? And he did it all without a hint of criticism, an experience which was completely foreign to me. I'd learned just about everything I knew about magic from my Uncle Harry, which I'd often joked was learning magic the hard way. He was not a warm and fuzzy teacher. Harry was quick with criticism and stingy with praise. Caldwell's approach wasn't the opposite. It was like the inverse, like Uncle Harry, but turned inside out. After the routine had been thoroughly dissected, I ran it again. As I'd felt with the card trick, the coin piece felt crisper, sharper, and in a word, better. I executed the final move and looked up at Caldwell. He stared back at me blankly. Well, that works, was all he said. Yes, it does, I agreed. Since I knew he had no interest in learning the routine himself, I was frantically trying to think of another piece of mine which could benefit from this process. The problem wasn't landing on one. The problem was narrowing it down to just a single choice. I realized that just about everything I performed could benefit from the sort of precise examination he offered. Before I could choose the next effect, I heard a muffled dinging. Caldwell reached into his coat pocket and pulled out his phone. That's 90 minutes, he said as he switched off the alert. That was what we agreed upon, right? 90 minutes? Give or take, I said quickly. I'm not a stickler on hitting the exact time for lessons. Happy to go for another half hour or hour, if you'd like. But Caldwell was already standing. He slid the phone back into his pocket and straightened his suit coat. No, we agreed upon 90 minutes. I just don't want you to feel shortchanged. I suggested, but he waved it away. I believe I've received the full value of the gift certificate, he said. I can report back to my co-workers on that point with confidence. He looked around the cluttered back room, orienting himself. Egress is through that curtain, correct? Yes, that's the way out. I followed him through the curtain as he headed toward the shop door. I grabbed the gift certificate off the counter as I passed it. If you want to use this again, feel free, I said, as I handed the sheet toward him. He was already halfway to the door. No, thank you. That was fine, he said. As I mentioned, I'm not really into magic and its accoutrements, but I appreciate your willingness to adjust the terms of your gift certificate to meet my needs. No problem, I said as I opened the door for him. The bell above it tinkled as the door swung open. Thank you and have a nice day, Caldwell said as he slipped through the door. No, thank you, I replied, but he was already gone. I let go of the knob and the door swung slowly shut. I moved back to my original position behind the counter, scanning the gift certificate as I did. The sound of the bell tinkling over the door made me spin around in giddy anticipation, but it was just Uncle Harry stopping by before heading to the bar next door for lunch with the other Minneapolis mystics. Expecting someone, he said, surprised by my unexpected interest in his arrival. No, I just thought it was a magic student coming back. Maybe he forgot something, I offered, as I stepped behind the counter. I set the gift certificate down. You just had a lesson? I did indeed, I said. That might have been the best magic lesson ever. Harry grinned at me. I'm so glad you've started giving lessons, he said. It's fun when the student becomes the teacher. And more fun when the teacher becomes the student, I said. I didn't bother to look up to see his response to my comment. I already had my four silver half dollars out and was practicing what Caldwell had revealed to me over the last hour or so. In fact, I was so engrossed 
I barely registered the sound of the bell when Harry left. <laughs> You know, that uh, that story is an odd one in the book because there is no mystery to it. There's no mystery in it. There's a couple stories in the book that are not mysteries or don't have a crime in them. Uh, and I don't really know exactly where it came from. I just started writing it, and all of a sudden this character showed up who had no interest in magic and but had a gift certificate. Um, it was sort of based on uh, when I was a teenager, uh, I had gone shopping with my mother for Christmas presents. We were at Spencer Gifts. You remember Spencer Gifts? Sure. And they had this talking parrot, this stuffed parrot. I can and I said, my brother Joe would love that. Although I really didn't think he would. I didn't think she'd buy it. She bought it for him well. and gave it to him and said, if you don't like it, I have the receipt. You can take it back. And he said, I don't like it. <laughs> And he took it back and he came home and he said, do you have any idea how hard it is to spend $50 of store credit in Spencer gifts? <laughs> uh, I could have done it in my day. Yeah. I, I, Spencer gifts. Still, I, I still, if I see one, I'll put my head in the door for a second. Cause there's all kinds of, remember those, those goofy light things that they yeah. had uh, they, filaments and they yeah. would change colors and yeah. It was, an, it was an interesting place, but not not for my brother Joe. Yeah, so no. um, that's that was the idea of giving someone a gift certificate. Who, in the story, I think Eli says he thinks they're this guy's coworkers are kind of mean because he clearly would not have any interest in a uh, hundred dollars worth of uh, anything in a magic store. But that's the the story that ended up, and it ended up being about uh, a good way to to give notes and get notes and. That's why Ken Weber is with us today. He literally wrote the book on how to give and get notes along with everything else you need to know as a performer. And it, it really it, it, as, it doesn't even apply just to performers. It, it applies to anybody who is going to stand up and talk in front of people for anything. It could be anything. Uh, teachers, lawyers, whatever. There's something in that book that can help you. It's a great book. And normally, you know, I, I try to figure out the one little nugget that I could take from a, one of these interviews. I always find something I'm like, oh, well, that's fantastic. I'll be using that. There's so much in this yeah. interview yeah. that uh, short of an egg cream recipe, that might be the only thing I could say. Well, I love there's your short nugget. But everything else was like, wow, yes, wow, okay, yes, wow, okay, of course, wow. So it's great. Plus, there's a special guest. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ken is great. He's had several careers, two notable that we talk about. He was one of the most successful mentalist slash magicians in the country. Uh, Newsweek magazine named him one of the most frequently requested performers on the college circuit. He also runs Weber Asset Management, uh, where he manages literally millions of dollars of other people's money. Uh, but in the magic community, he's probably best known as the author of Maximum Entertainment 2.0, where he offers a kind of a blueprint. Well, not even kind of. It's, it's a blueprint for success and uh, some secrets that have helped top performers sort of, I don't know, distance himself from their peers, stand apart, I guess. Yes. What was fascinating, besides the fact that we finally got to talk to Ken, was that um, right before our scheduled chat, Ken was having lunch with his pal, Shep Hyken, and he invited Shep to drop in, which is what happens a few minutes into the interview. As someone in my former life who produced meetings and events, of course I knew Shep Hyken. He's a very well-known name as a business speaker, an author, um, and he's one of these uh, guys like our friend Joe Calloway, who you don't really think of as a motivational speaker. He's more of a business speaker who can talk to you and your people about how to create relationships with customers and employees. Yeah, I think that the term motivational speaker gets a bad rap, but these business speaker guys who really have their fingers on the pulse of how to create engagement with customers and with employees uh, those are the real deal, and he absolutely is one of those. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame uh, for the National Speakers Association. Along with our pals, uh, Joe Calloway and George Campbell. Now we yes. have three. Three. Yes. Also in that elite are a couple of my favorite 
business speakers from my past life, Mike McKinley and DeWitt Jones. Oh, um, DeWitt Jones. I which, saw that. National Geographic photographer, right? You recommended him to us. Oh, uh, did I? Good. Because I, I think the world of him, he's terrific. He was a fantastic speaker. He, uh, I mean, he, he and uh, Mike McKinley, there the are speakers who, and with Joe Calloway, uh, where there's stuff from their speech that I still remember to this day. And I'll give you right. a couple examples of those. With uh, DeWitt Jones, he had these wonderful pictures of a woman working at a loom, I think, in Scotland. And um, he said uh, to her as he's taking these gorgeous pictures, what do you think about when you're weaving? And she said, uh, when I weave, I weave. And that I use that a lot when it's like, just focus on what you're doing. Do yeah. the thing. Don't multitask. Uh, when I weave, I weave. So like when I walk the dogs, I walk the dogs. I'm not on the phone. I'm not doing something else. I'm with the dogs. Uh, the other one was Mike McKinley. And Mike McKinley was a, kind of an old school business speaker. I don't know if you ever saw him. I don't he, think I did. No. He was something of a character. Um, uh, he uh, started his own business as a garbage collector in his age 12. Right. Had a lot of business experience. But he said two things that really stuck with me. One is you have to realize in life you're going to work with people where if they stepped in front of the car, you're going to have to really think about which pedal to hit. <laughs> and it's true. You're going to run into people where, oh, man, I just got to deal with I just got to deal with this person. The other thing he said, which is related to that, which stuck with me even more, was he said, remember at work, the people you're working with, that some of them. Coming to work is the only good part of their life. Oof. And when you keep that in the back of your mind, it does really have an impact how you interact with people in working situations, even not your own job, but just you walk into a store and you're talking to a clerk. Just keep in mind that this might be as good as it's going to get for Oof. them and try to make it as nice as possible. So, well, now I will remember both of those things. Yeah. Anyway, um, speaking of speakers, uh, Ken Weber and... Chip Hyken uh, are going to talk to us a little bit about, about how to give notes, how to take notes. But before we got into that, we touched on a far more important topic. To all of us, myself to, included. To anyone who appreciate the better things in life, we talked about how to make a good egg cream. I think we met once before at, I think, Magi Fest. Uh, I was chatting with Joe Diamond, and I think you were there, and the topic of the elements you needed to make a good egg cream came up, and I couldn't <laughs> place the name of the chocolate syrup, and you had it on the tip of your tongue. Um, As, there were many topics you could have brought up, and I'd say, well, that wasn't me, but that narrows it down quite a bit. Yeah, I yeah. think it was you, and it's uh, Unita chocolate syrup. Is that, am I remembering that right? Uh, there is Unita. That, yeah. That's one of them. But, okay. But now that's hard to find. Yes. I think, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong on this. I think there's only one place in the Twin Cities that actually has egg creams on the menu, and that'd be Cecil's Deli yeah, near correct. your nape of the neck. I, I've never found it anywhere else in the Twin Cities. They may have them now at uh, at Blue Sun Soda, John. Ah. Now, uh, expanded it's, to a little. It's uh, not hard to make. Yeah. No, I, I used to make them all the time at home because I read about it originally in Harpo Speaks. And I thought, oh. I've got to, I've got to find out how to do this. And uh, I was probably one of the few teenagers making his own egg creams. <laughs> anyway, that's not why we're here today. So I don't want to take up a bunch of time because you. But I do there. want the, I do want the, his signature uh, sauce. If there, if there's a, because all I get is Hershey's. <clears throat> it's yeah, it's third, Hershey's works fine. It's not as good as it, the original syrup was Oster's or okay. Austin's. That original. sounds right. Yeah, and uh, you can't. That's out of business completely. You can't get it. But Hershey's is the substitute. Uh, Fox's You Bet is the other one. Fox's you Bet, that's you. it. You Bet. The Fox's letter U dash Bet, You Bet. Is that um, a regional thing? Because I don't know that I've ever seen that. In it, the... It's it's not a big national company, but I don't know where they are. Okay. You know, I, just, no, I, I, I will. Uh, even in New York, it's hard to find now. But um, I will look when I go. If I have a tall glass, I put in like a uh, half an inch of ch chocolate syrup. No, I put it in milk. I could put in an inch and a half of milk, whole milk. Yeah. And then maybe half an inch of the syrup, uh, you know, this is from experience, who measures? You stir it around so you have a, a thick chocolate, a, a, a sweet chocolate milk, and the rest is just seltzer. And it's gonna foam up, but you slowly 
stir it up as it goes in. I feel okay. sort of ashamed because I have a uh, uh, a glass that has been pre-printed with the measurements on it for my egg creams. I guess that makes me still sort of a newbie that I can't just eyeball it. Well, yeah. many that I get these days are not sweet enough. They're a little stingy with the uh, syrup. So it should taste like a chocolatey soda. Yeah, it's it's a great thing. I don't know why it's gone away. It's And the original Austin's or Oster's, uh, there was no milk. It was a secret recipe, and there might have been egg in it. Nobody really knows, but it was just the syrup and the seltzer, and that was the best of all. But you can't get it anymore, and I think it's one of the most refreshing drinks there yeah. is. So there you are. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Um, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Either way. Yeah, let's let's jump in. You know, your book was a huge, huge help for me in writing the Eli Marks books, more for learning what they do wrong than right, because that's just more interesting in the books to have Eli do stuff wrong and have his Uncle Harry correct him. In this particular episode, our listening audience will have just heard Eli go through an experience with a, a reluctant customer, someone who has a gift certificate and has to use it and ends up getting magic lessons from Eli. And, and in the process gives Eli a handful of really good notes to the point where he he's basically almost willing to pay the guy to stick around because it's hard to get notes that good. And for me, your chapter on note giving is it's good for anyone telling anyone else how to make what they're doing better. Uh, I can see using it with novelists. I can see using it with my movie making friends. The great British Bake Off could probably use something similar to it. So before we get to the specifics of that, because I want to go into a couple of them, what is your magic background? And from that, how did you get into writing what is now uh, you know, a standard text in the magic world? Um, to answer your question, I was a professional magician, meaning I had a business card, magic for all occasions. By the time I was 12 or 13, I, by the time I was uh, in high school, I was doing a lot of kid shows. Yes, my father had to drive me. Yes, he had to wait for me to finish. And uh, when I went to college, I was a, a theater major, a speech and drama major, actually, at Hofstra University studied uh, all kinds of aspects of theater, went to Brooklyn College for a master's degree in broadcasting, television broadcasting specifically, and there again studied directing and uh, acting and things like that. And then I thought I was going to be host of a television show, you know, the next Johnny Carson, but nobody would hear of such a ridiculous thing. So when a uh, agent called me and said, how'd you like to do, a hey kid, how'd you like to do two weeks on a cruise ship doing your uh, mentalism stuff? I said, okay. And that was it. Never looked back. Now, so I did that full time. I was a performer, a, a professional mentalist and hypnotist, toured the country, made a good living. Uh, and as I was making that good living, my other hobby was investing. I always cared about the stock market and investing. And so uh, I started as another hobby, a newsletter, a financial newsletter called Weber's Fund Advisor. And that grew into a large business where Weber, Weber Asset Management is now, we manage hundreds of millions of dollars of other people's money. I only bring that up to say, I'm still involved with the magic world as a mentor, as a person who directs and helps give notes, director's notes to magicians around the world. Uh, unlike many magicians, you have, because you went to school for it, you, you have a background in directing and stage, uh, which a lot of magicians just sort of learn on on the job and don't have the bigger picture that you have. I, and, I have suppose, no, and have no appreciation of what a, a true director does. You know, we've had uh, recently we just had John Lovick on talking about directing yeah. and people's uh, magicians unwillingness to um, submit to that. Why do you think a magicians really should think about if they're doing a paid show with a stage and an audience. I mean, I'm not talking to somebody doing a birthday party, but if you're doing people in seats, why do you think a director is a good thing to consider? I have some quotes in the book, um, in Maximum Entertainment 2.0. I have um, notes that weren't in the original uh, about the concept of directing. I think from Darren Brown and some of the other top, top people, you never see yourself, even if you followed my advice to video your shows, you could never dispassionately see yourself, your strengths and your flaws, the way a director sitting out there where the audience sits or watching uh, dispassionately. Uh, you can never see yourself that way. And so, and so unless you have some background you know, or appreciation of theater, you find it hard. Well, I, I, you know, comedians don't have directors. Why do I need one? And that's a fatal mistake for, you know, 80, 90% of magicians, unfortunately. We've been joined 
by uh, Shep Heitken, a surprise guest. We've never had a surprise guest on the show before. Very exciting. It is. It's really fun. Since you're here, surprisingly, have you had any experience working with a director? And and what do you think the value of that is for a performer, particularly a magician? Sure. And in my world where I'm doing public speaking, which also um, I, I, my background is magic and I incorporate magic into my speech. We don't call it a director. We call it a coach. And even uh, someone like myself, who's been in this for 40 years and I've been received awards for what I do. I still think I go back to my coach and go, will you watch me? What am I doing wrong? What bad habits did I get into? What can I improve? And every single time, I don't care how good I've gotten, there's always opportunity to get better. And I love the idea of the coach. And we have this long relationship on top of it. So she's watched me in person. She's watched video and she gives me great advice. You know, my background is in theater. So the concept of getting notes from a director is uh, both um, something I'm very familiar with, I'm very comfortable with, and I, I wouldn't want to do a piece of theater without a director who was watching it and giving notes. But in the magic world, when you largely are probably working on your own most of the time, conceiving, choosing the material, putting it together, do you think there's some resistance to having somebody look at your stuff are you do you experience that a, a resistance from magicians to take some uh, some notes or I don't want to say criticism because that's not what I'm talking about but just some refining maybe should I handle that or Shep you want to do it I just I want you I want to hear your answer but I'll do the short answer is number one I think they're afraid to hear the truth yep. mm. and that's a big part of it and also um Frankly, are they willing to spend the money to get the right person in to direct and coach them? Yeah. What do, what do you think, Ken? Well, the answer is that. Plus, you can have an entire library room for your magic books, and there could be not a single mention of working with somebody outside you. Not a single mention of it. Yeah. You learn how to do a good double lift or good tenkai diagonal shift palm crap. I don't know. <laughs> I'm speaking code here, aren't I? Yeah, that's yeah. code enough, I think. Code enough. You know, so the techniques are explained in great detail, but never are you doing it correctly. Are you holding the audience's attention? Do you have a through line? Is what you think having impact having an impact? Do you build to a climax? Are you controlling every moment? Does the, does the audience understand where you're going with this? You know, the, yeah. you see that it all broken down in the book, but there's just so many places a routine that a magician does can break down in the audience's eyes. You can still get applause, but doesn't mean, you know, the, the working title, by the way, of my book was Raise Your Level. Because if you're low, you get higher. If you're near the top, you can still get higher. Mm. Yeah. David Copperfield, I attended a lecture uh, that he did uh, for the New York Historical Society. And he talked about glorious torture, the glorious torture of ripping apart new routines. And then, you know, scrutinizing moment by moment what worked, what didn't work. And he has, and he has a team of high paid people working with him. And even then, it could take a year or longer to fully polish a routine. Yeah. So can, between us, if you promise not to share, yeah, I, I would still polish some of those routines if, if they asked me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always about raising the level. You can always, there you you can always raise the level. Ken, I'm interested in how you got into that portion of, of helping people. Because like I say, we, we talked to John Lovick and he had a great quote, something about he, he came to realize that problems in other people's acts weren't his problem. So he stopped just offering uh, to help. But you have quite the history with people coming to you and saying, hey, what's wrong here? How did you how did that start? It started in a rather dramatic way. I belong to an association, the Psychic Entertainers Association, and we have a once a year convention and we always have members get up and perform, you know, the Friday night show, the Saturday night show. And um, I would stand in the back with Bob Cassidy, some names you might know, uh, yeah. other people. And uh, we would just basically make snide comments in the back. You know, why is he doing that? That's terrible. Arr, arr. But the way Bob Cassidy talked. And, you know, we would go back and forth, the two of us. And I realized, okay, this is not helping anybody. You know, we're getting our little jollies doing that, but it's petty and it's not moving anybody forward. It's not moving the craft forward. So I started making some notes and then I realized, okay, I'm going to do a lecture about the shows. Actually, we had Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night show. And on Sunday morning, 
I think it was a Sunday morning. I said, I'm going to do a critique of all the performers. And they said, are you crazy? It actually, actually had been attempted once before and it was a disaster. They had like a, a round table, you know, three or four so-called experts were going to, and it, it was a disaster. They said, Ken, no, this is, this won't work. I said, let's, let's try it. And um, I, I did it. The only criticism I got was, Ken, you didn't spend enough time on me. <laughs> and uh, I got a standing ovation. And then the next year, the next convention chairperson asked me to do it again. And the next one and the next one. And it became a regular thing at the Psychic Entertainers Association conventions. And I realized, okay, I'm saying a lot of the same things again and again. Because I thought, at first I thought I can't write a book because every performer is so unique. The problems they have are unique. But I realized there's a lot of overlap that I was saying. And so I started outlining a book. And next thing I know, I had 250 pages and published it and sold out more than 90% of any magic books ever published without any real marketing. <laughs> no, no lecture tour, nothing. It just sold. Uh, and then like, I don't know, 12 years later, what was it? I said, there's a lot more that I have to say because I saw magic differently. And I wrote uh, the updated and expanded version 2.0. So that's, that's the history. It's, and it's terrific. It's like I say, I used it all through writing the books and it, it really is good for anyone who stands on a stage uh, to read that book. Let's dive into some of the the notes you have on how to give notes. We're not going to do all of them because I don't want to give away all of uh, chapter 23, I think. I don't want to give it all away, but there's some key things here that sort of come up in the short story with Eli and the and the gentleman he works with there who very disinterestingly, disinterestedly, I think, goes through his act and tears it apart for him. So you have, you've broken down into two different sections, how to give notes uh, and how to get notes. Let's just talk about giving notes for now. First, uh, one that jumped out at me was only do it with permission. And Jim and I have had this discussion before about at what point after a performance should I, as a director, come up to him Jim as a performer and tell him what was right and right was wrong. Uh, you, you have to do it with their permission. It's always awkward. And to this day, even as the quote guy who wrote the book, <laughs> you know, I still find it difficult to say, you know, Bill, have you thought about? And <clears throat> if I ever do that, it's for something that I know for a fact would be very useful. But sometimes I'll see a performer three times before I approach them. We are all delicate human beings, have yeah. delicate egos. Uh, I have a little bit of an advantage in, in that I'm known now as a mentor and a director. But um, yeah, there, there's people that Shep and I both know well, who I would love to <laughs> spend a little more time with. I wish they would ask me, but if they don't ask, I generally don't say anything. With younger performers, it's easier. You know, somebody say under 30. Basically in this life now, Shep, everybody to me is younger. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so, but with younger performers, uh, it's, it's a little easier. They know my name. Um, and so if I say, can I tell you a couple of things? Oh, sure. You know, I must say, maybe it's because of the book and maybe it's because of some things of John Lovick and John Armstrong and, and Bob Fitch. There used to be no directors. Yeah. Maybe the book had something to do with it. Maybe not. But, um, there used to be no directors that I ever heard of in magic, although I'm sure there were, but now it's a thing, you know, I'm working with so-and-so yeah. and John Armstrong, John Lovick are among the, are among the top people. Yes, Shep. And consider people like, you know, uh, Frank Oz and David Mamet who produced yeah. or directed amazing shows <laughs> in New York of great magicians, Ricky Jay and, uh, Derek. Derek Delgadio. Yep. Yeah, exactly the point. I mean, here you have Derek Delgadio, who was off, did a smash hit off Broadway show, and Ricky Jay, who was beloved and he was highly respected by the magic community, both at the top of their craft. And magicians would think 90% of magicians would have said, well, they don't need a director. And look who they got. They got two of the most famous directors in the world yeah. to make their shows better. Shep, do you have instances where you've been given notes by people who didn't respect your boundaries and just sort of forced themselves on you? I, I, I've told this story to Jim before. Uh, we had a performer for a corporate event, comedian Larry Miller, and at the end of his set, and Larry Miller's been doing this for many, many years. He's quite good at what he does. The client came over to me. She said, uh, is Larry back there? And I said, yes. And she said, I have some notes for him about his act. <laughs> And she's the client. I can't stop her. And I said, well, yeah, let's give him a few minutes. And then she did go over and gave him, you know, her notes. Mm -hmm. And he was 
gracious about it. There are other performers who would have been not so gracious, but uh, everybody thinks they know what's what's right or wrong with what you're doing on stage. Shep, have, what have your experiences been along those lines? Well, I have the personality of welcoming people into my life. So if somebody wants to share what I think is good constructive criticism up to it. And by the way, that situation that you talk about with a corporate client happened exactly to me. I was hired to do four cities on a short tour with a client. Uh, and I told them that they were putting me on for way too long of a time. They insisted they do this all the time. That's the way the format works. The audience used to it. And I said, okay. And I figured for what they want me to do, I'm going to be about a, the best guy they've ever had do it. <laughs> I'm confident I could pull it off. Uh, and here's what happened at the end. They came back with notes and they said, number one, I think we agree. We need to cut, cut it back to 90 minutes. Do you imagine, a, 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 I mean, I'm not a famous comedian and I don't do, I do a little bit of magic in my speech, as I mentioned, but I'm a talking head for 90 minutes. I don't even use slides up until recently. So they, I took their notes and they had some very specific suggestions. And the next time I walked out on stage a week later, I had implemented every one of them. And they were overwhelmed with the fact that I would listen to them and actually take action. And I told them, you made it a better speech. At the end of the four dates, what happened? They loved me. They booked me for more. And, and the fact is, we have to be open to this type of critique. Critique is not criticism. Critique is help and support. Uh, so I look at it that way. If somebody comes across and tells me everything I did wrong, I'm going to simply flippantly say, well, what did I do right? That's one of the, the notes that uh, can you have in your list, which yeah. is start with the good things. And, and by the way, said, end with a good thing, too. Oh, I don't say that, Shep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's see, Shep, said, Shep said he had a welcoming, he has a welcoming personality, which I can attest is true. But that's because the guy is from uh, St. Louis, you know, I'm from New York. Screw your notes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you come over, if you come over to me, some woman who I never heard of is going to tell me. But yeah, so if you have that, and I think most actually, most professionals would certainly be gracious. You know, they wouldn't really say screw your notes, lady. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you where to where to file. Yeah, here, here, file your notes right here. here. Here's where you file yeah. your notes. <laughs> I'll give you these notes. You want some notes? I'll give you some notes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it is a tricky thing. Uh, I think to, I mean, if there is a director and you have hired a director to watch what you do and give you some feedback and try to get you to the next level, that is one. Uh, you know, uh, I think then yes, my goodness, you should listen to the notes. Unsolicited notes are uh, as a performer, we get them all the time, and sometimes I. Well, I always listen and sometimes I take them and sometimes I say to myself, they don't, that's not a note that I'm going to implement because they don't see the picture the way I see the picture. And it's my picture right now. And in the book, we talk about that. And most of us will listen to the notes that somebody gives us and we will nod. If they've read my book, they will nod and say, thank you. And they will in their head say, what a bunch of crap for some of it. Mm -hmm. And I give the experience of me getting a note from, um, I think I mentioned the name, Lior Manor, dear friend, great performer, um, who gave me a note after one of my shows. And I said, well, you know, thank you, Lior, but I've been doing this 30 years. That gets a big laugh. It got a big laugh tonight. So uh, sorry, friend, you're, that's not applicable, not true. And it wasn't until, I don't know, two or three days later that I literally slapped my head. Maybe not literally, but certainly figuratively, I said, damn, you know, this was, I, the problem is I have been doing it for 30 years and it's no longer politically correct. And I'm yeah. a politically correct guy. It's yeah. just when you're in a rut, when you're in a pattern, because it gets a big laugh, I didn't even think about it. But it took me several days of letting it marinate before it came to, to the front of my eyes instead of the back of my head. And uh, so sometimes and, you just say thank you and then you move on because you never know which are gonna be the ones that smack you in the middle of your head in a day or a week. And, and that's a perfect example of one of uh, your recommendations, which is make note of the note and come back to it a few days later or a week later and look at it again when some time has passed. And you, you know, uh, with Jim and I, we have a thing called show day, which is as me as a director or more of a stage manager for corporate events. 
I can only say positive things on show day. Uh, but after show day, we can sit down and tear it apart and figure out what worked and what didn't work. And that's, as you said, Ken, we're all fragile human beings and being a performer is hard enough without someone piling on, as uh, you call it in the notes. You, you, you like we said, uh, you open with something nice and, and if you're Shep, you'll close with something nice. But you who, also- Who invited Shep? I... <laughs> we are delighted to have Shep here. You invited Shep. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's right. That's what a moron I am. <laughs> But one of your one of your recommendations is be specific, uh, and I'm wondering if each of you guys can give me an example of, uh, and I'm including you, Jim, of a note that you got that because I'm sure we've all gotten notes where they say, oh, "I just didn't like it." Well, that doesn't help anybody. Are there examples of specific notes that you found to be really helpful? Uh, yeah, I can. I, there's a line that I use in my speech, and uh, my speech coach, by the way, is Patricia Fripp. She's a, a coach, director, yeah. uh, phenomenal uh, the speaker as well. Yeah, yeah. And she said, Shep, and she really tore it apart. I mean, I would say she took 30 pages of notes in my 40 minute speech. A very funny story. As she was doing this later on, I was talking to the client. I go, what do you think? Oh, you were great. And there is one lady that she loved you. You should see all the notes she was taking. And he didn't realize that person <laughs> was with me. Anyway, here's the line. I'm going to try to tell you. I it's, I tell a story about a cab driver and the voice sounded nothing like the man that I was looking at. And I say, I, I, I say uh, as part of my response, I look behind the car to see if there was a ventriloquist throwing his voice. Okay, and it gets a laugh. You have to hear the whole thing. And she said, stop right there. Uh, let's look at that line. Jerry Seinfeld says he'll work a year to take 10 words down to seven or eight. And she said, Everybody knows a ventriloquist throws his or her voice. Just say, I looked behind the car to see if there was a ventriloquist. Boom, stop. It took me quite a few practices and actually doing it live to get comfortable stopping at the end of that after having said that line for so long. But there's an example of just throwing his voice, eliminate three words. It made the joke, the line stronger. And sometimes that's what we're looking for is nuances. So we've got to look for that detail and specificity. In the writing game, we call that addition by subtraction. Yep. Uh, in my life as a coach, I don't really talk, I don't really name the people I work with, but the only one I do name, because he made it public, uh, is Josh Jay, Joshua Jay. So I'm talking to the magic listeners now, but he's a very big name in the, in the magic world. And a past guest on this show. Well, that's a great guest. Um, he's a great guest, yeah. Yeah, and he's... So I've known him since he was a teenager, and uh, I worked with him on his magic live uh, one-man show. So it was like a 55-minute, I don't remember the time, uh, show. And I worked with him for several months going down to his apartment uh, and just working moment by moment, minute by minute, second by second. You know, he's doing a routine. Stop. Okay, do that again. I could see that. Stop. Right there, you know. And so it becomes... Uh, yeah, it's very, very specific. The more, getting back to the original topic of this last few minutes, the more specific the advice or the critique or the note, the more useful it will be for sure. Yeah, that's, I, 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 certainly in my theater world, uh, generally the notes are very specific and very actionable. Slow that down. They're missing this because you're rushing through it. Slow down. Uh, or uh you know i mean the, the the more specific the note is the easier it is for me to take it and b b use it uh, down the road and and that in turn obviously makes the audience experience that much better and and that's what we're about i think is that relationship is the most important relationship in my life i'm just going to check and make sure my my wife and children were out of earshot there, but that relationship between the performer and the audience is, is the is the single most important relationship I have. To maintain that, to service that relationship, and to give them my absolute best, I think I, I don't understand how you can do it without somebody watching you and giving you some constructive criticism. If you if you really want to be good at this, well, I agree. That's why I spent two years writing the book, and then another <laughs> another two years revising it. I don't understand. Um, I mean, thankfully, we've sold 
thousands of copies of the book, again, with almost no advertising, you know, so hopefully things are changing somewhat in the magic world, at least. Let's let's flip to the other side of the coin, because many of our listeners are magicians who might occasionally receive notes. And you've got some some good ideas for them about the, you know, how do you take a note from somebody? And I think the first one in that list, if I'm remembering, is be gracious about it. And I think, uh, Shep, you kind of already touched on that, that uh, be a professional and just nod and, and, and say thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, like I mentioned, I have a welcoming personality. I'm open to anything. I also recognize when people are qualified and not qualified, and I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. You know, it's I, I have this saying, the customer's not always right, but they're always the customer. Well, the audience member is not always right, but they're always part of the audience. Right. Actually, number one, the number one, how to receive notes and how to give notes for both is do it in private. Yeah. yeah. If if you've been into magic or probably even theater or even the business world or the speaking world, at some point you've seen people try to give a helpful suggestion in front of other people, an unsolicited suggestion in front of other people. Big red flag. Please don't do that. So as a magician listening to this, what, what should he or she do when they've stepped off stage and somebody comes up and there's a crowd around and they want to give them a suggestion? How How do you graciously handle that? Well, listen, I really would like to hear that. Thank you very much for thinking of me that way. But um, I've got to wrap it up. Um, can you put th this down on paper or can you give me your email and maybe we can follow up or a phone number or something? Uh, you got to figure out how to sidestep. It hurts to get um, notes right after a show. I mean, it's just, it's not easy. It's just not pleasant. You either feel great about the show you just did or you feel, oh, that didn't go the way I wanted. Either way, you don't want to hear criticism at that moment. Uh, I would say minimum time is an hour, <laughs> you know, after a show. Yeah, I, I've broken that rule a number of times, but that's because I know one of us is leaving. But you, you want a buffer. Um, again, we're human beings and uh, we have egos. And especially as performers. And, and John, early on, you said the book uh, has many, many chapters. And I've heard this over and over and over and over again. Uh, that are good for beyond magic. And so, you know, it applies to everybody and every human being is should be getting helpful critiques. Yeah, I, I think about, uh, as we're talking, I think about the greatest athletes in the world. Uh, if you take a look at, you know, the, the uh, uh, and I'm not, I'm gonna, not going to use this as an athletic or sports analogy, but there's a very famous picture of uh, a batter being coached he was the number one batter. I mean, it was Mark McGuire who, mm. you know, broke records. Albert Pujols needed not only a batting coach, but also when he went into a slump, he recognized the need to talk to somebody to get some feedback on how we can overcome. Uh, there was a, a block that was getting in his way and, you know, time after time he was striking out. And I think about these athletes. There's a great picture of Tiger Woods standing over a putt with his, and at the height of his career. And his coach is right next to him telling him what he can do better. And these are people at the top of their careers. That's why uh, I, I love it when a, uh, an actor gives credit to the director for directing them to do what they're already good at and just make them better. That is the thing. Is it's, it's like I think the, the longer you have spent in whatever, if, if, whether it's golf or baseball or theater or magic, the longer you have spent and the more committed you are to this as your life and the higher you have gone level wise, the more willing you are to say, what do you, what do you think? Or, or I, I, I will absolutely listen to my peers. I'll listen to a director. I, I would never think of doing a show without a director, but my background isn't necessarily magic. Although a substantial part of you know my background is magic associated but theater is my background and, and and there just would be no way that I would do a show without a qualified director that was being paid money to uh, share their expertise and watch what's going on I, I just uh, I can't understand how you would get better when you are so darn close to something without someone looking at it and saying, this is, you may think this is what you're doing, but this is the way it reads to an audience. Right. Do you understand that? And lots of times we don't until somebody smarter or different than us, at least, gives us that perspective. Let me just jump back and say that in the book, 
I say not everybody can afford a, a director, uh, or even if you've had one in the past, you all have, everybody listening to us uh, now has, and I wish I had my iPhone, oh, here it is. You have a tool that I didn't have growing up in Magic. This is in a complete recording studio, beautiful, full color, uh, sharp audio and video. You can just give it to a friend or mount it on a tripod and say, tape it, please. And then you go home and you watch it. And it's very, very difficult. It is and, difficult. And, and listen as well. Don't just watch, yeah, but listen. Of, of course. Listen and watch crowd and reaction. Listen and yeah. that's right. And I generally say, and once is not enough, because especially if you're new in the business, you're watching yourself and you're loving yourself or you're hating yourself. Um, but it's sometimes the fourth or fifth time that you see something and you realize, ooh, right there, right there is where I need to smooth it out. Um, so that's a tool that, that was unavailable to Houdini and everybody else until you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I mean, we had camcorders, but it wasn't in your pocket. Right. It was on your shoulder. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's an amazing techno technological breakthrough that uh, is available now that should not be overlooked. Do you think people feel like, in my experience as, a, as an actor, I don't necessarily ever feel threatened by the director because I understand what that process is. Do you think magicians, there's a, a level of threat to that relationship that they are unused to? They didn't grow up with it or they wasn't part of their- If they've never grown up in the theater and have never worked with a director at all, yeah, I could imagine that being, you know, just tell me how my moves were, how my technique yeah. is, you know? I, I, cause, because we have been to magic conventions and magic clubs, and we've seen that if you do this, you get a reaction. Doesn't mean that when Shep does it or when Ken does it, it'll get that same reaction. Right. It'll probably get a better reaction, right, Shep? Right. <laughs> but we don't that's know that for thinking. sure. Yeah. How did you know what I was thinking? Oh, that's what I'm you do. I'm a mentalist. Keep <laughs> stay on the same page, Shep. Come on. You know, so we, we don't know what's going to work until uh, we see it for ourselves uh, this passionately on, on a video screen. So we talk about human nature and one of the key things we all have is a, a desire to push back. Why should, when I'm, uh, when someone is uh, receiving notes, uh, you say, don't argue, don't attempt to explain. Why do you think that's the best way to handle that? Number four, never argue or attempt to explain. And I said that because so often they will either say that I'm wrong, as, as I did to my friendly or manure, um, you know, <laughs> uh, which was stupid of me, uh, or they will explain, yes, but on most nights, it's this, or that happened because that guy was a jerk. That gets you nowhere. It just gets you nowhere. You just absorb the advice, you absorb the notes, uh, and you remember them, and you stash it away. You've, hopefully, you've recorded the conversation. Shep and I at lunch, Shep was giving me some uh, business advice, and it was so good. I said, Shep, do you mind if I take out my phone and record your voice? And he said, no problem at all. Because I'm going to jump back now. About a year ago, uh, you, we mentioned Joshua J. He and his buddy Andy run Magi Fest, a convention for magicians. And they asked me to do what they call Magi Fest University. And uh, early on in my session, I said, everybody take a piece of paper and a pen if you haven't already and write this down. I said, write down, quote, take notes, period. Ken Weber says, take notes, period. Ken Weber says, take more notes, period. I made it funny, not like right now, but I did make it funny. <laughs> but I said, write it down, <laughs> write it down. And my point being is, I'm a pretty smart guy. And I'll tell you why I say that. I'm so smart that when I watch a lecture of any type, oh, that's a great point. I'll remember that because that's such a clear, cogent, important point. No way will I forget that. I forget it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just happened so many times in my life. You think I would learn. Maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I would, was. So my point being is I used to make fun of people who took a lot of notes. No, they're the smart ones. Yeah. You watch a lecture or, or you're listening to a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, somebody's giving you advice. It's got to be recorded or you just take out the pen and paper and you, and you just take notes of the cogent points that they're saying to you. And the thing about taking a lot of notes, and I take a lot of notes when I go to certain events, when I'm sitting in the audience, 
is I realize I don't have to keep all the notes. It's right. like taking pictures with your iPhone. It's a digital picture. So take 10 of them because you can get rid of nine of them and only keep the one you want. And once I go through my notes, uh, and I just went through an entire day of coaching on the speaking business, and I took four single line spaces of bullet points of notes. And when I was done, I narrowed it down to the 10 I know that I can take action on. That meant I got rid of three and almost two thirds of a page of notes to be able to focus on the most important ones. That's going to make me better. I don't need to do all of it right now because I can't. Yeah, whenever I do a speech and have an opportunity, if I'm, if I'm going to be the closing speaker of that session, I'm not going to necessarily sit around all day, although I do want to hear the CEO or president deliver his comments or her comments. Uh, if there's something relevant, I'll sit there and take notes because if I can bring that into my speech in any way, just as any performer can bring into the fact of, uh, hey, we're in St. Louis today. And I can mention, I just went last night to this great restaurant and had some St. Louis delicacy. I'm going to endear myself to the audience. It shows that I take the time to know who the audience is and to incorporate a comment that was made an hour before that most people remember just makes me even look smarter than I am. Yeah. You're plenty smart, Shep. Don't short sell yourself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Under promise, over deliver. Isn't that That's, like what we always try and do? Boy, I, I don't know how often I have to remind myself of that. But yes, that's the key to the benefits program. All right. It's time for us to wrap up this portion because we spent, uh, I've taken up way too much of your uh, lovely Florida time. Uh, so let's just maybe if each of you could sort of give us one final thought on the on the value of of not only giving notes but giving them uh, let's call it the Ken Weber way why should magicians or anybody dealing with a situation where you need to critique someone what do you think is the one thing they should remember one thing oh man i have 10 on how to give notes and 10 on how to <laughs> notes. receive notes and i thought and thought and thought about all those you know th there's no one i mean honestly because and, and i don't say that uh, to, yeah. to wiggle out of this but because having done this for so long and with so many different people what works for uh, john or jim or shep is going to be different yeah. you know than for works for josh or jay or you know uh, somebody else. E each one of those things is different. Um, I, I would say if I had to narrow it down, I would say the video thing, you got to watch yourself, whether you're a speaker or a teacher. Yeah. I mean, I've had many people who say uh, my wife or her husband is a teacher and I gave him or her the book and they said they got a lot out of it. Yeah. Um, anybody who's in front of a group of people, I think can benefit certainly if not from all the book, but uh, from the sections on how to improve your appearance, your your ability to be in front of an audience, to hold their attention, and certainly what we're talking about today, how to give, I used to call it criticism, and how to receive criticism. As it was pointed out earlier, criticism doesn't mean it's a negative. By the way, another quote from a very wise writer was, he did it all with a, without a hint of criticism. That was a great line, uh, John. Thank you. Because it means, it means that you can impart your observations without making the receiver of it uh, feel bad in any way. You know, it's not criticism. It's an observation. And I'm on your side. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the same team as you here. I'm just trying to trying to help. Shep, okay. do, you, do you have any one precept you'd walk away with that you'd want people I'm, to remember? I'm going to give you two. The first is uh, you want a 360 view of your performance. And that comes through, as Ken was saying, a videotape. That'll give you 180 degrees if you watch it by yourself. The other 180 is gonna come from somebody that you would ask, hey, watch this. By the way, it's real important that the audio of the audience gets picked up as well as you so that they can hear the reaction and get a sense of the timing. But you want somebody else to give you that other 180 degree feedback. So that's my first advice is make sure it's not just you watching, but somebody else or more than one person giving you feedback. Number two, if you haven't figured it out, buy the darn book, Maximum mm -hmm. Entertainment. Yeah, yeah. 2.0. 2.0. You know, <laughs> get it. Call today. Don't delay. Do not pass, go, or collect $200 until you get this book. Doesn't seem fair that uh, our interview with Ken Weber ends with a, a quote from Shep Heiken, but that's just the way it happened. Well, he's, he's telling you to buy uh, Ken's book, which, yeah, yeah. and that, that interview, uh, like I say, a, as a, a guy who has a, the opportunity to get up in front of people, there was so much 
in that interview that I was like, yeah. oh yeah, sure. Why didn't I think of that? That's yeah. it, it was just great. Just great stuff. All of them. All, all both of them. I mean, not all of them, both of them. Yes. It's a very thoughtful book. Yeah. And and well worth a read, even if, like I say, even if you're not a magician or an actor or a stand-up comedian, if you have any reason to stand up in front of people, whatever that may be, this is a book you should read because there are tons of little things that can, that, that if you don't have uh, experience in front of people, you would never know. Yeah. Uh, you would just never tumble to it. Right. And even if you have tons of experience standing up in front of people, there's stuff in this book that will make you yeah. better at it, better at e what you do. Even if you're doing something as simple as giving a toast at a wedding. Yeah. You're going to benefit from maximum entertainment too, I don't. There's, there's a, a reason why the, the book has never gone out of print and why he didn't need to do any marketing on it. It, it. it really does sell itself. And there's so, you know, we could dig down and talk about every little thing. The the thing that, uh, one thing I loved about what he said was critique with permission. Don't just walk up to somebody and tell them what's wrong with their act. Boy, I would hope that everybody has that, uh, that, that sense that there is a, 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 a right time and a wrong time and B almost always it's the wrong time. Yeah. It, it just, it, you, you, Especially if you have not been, if your advice has not been solicited, mm -hmm. uh, my mantra in life is this. I'm only going to have opinions on the things I have opinions about. I'm not going to have to have an opinion on everything. Just the stuff I have opinions on. Yeah. If you want them, I'll give it to you. But I, I'm not, I'm not going to have an opinion on everything. And, uh, and uh, the idea of somebody coming up to a performer especially if you know you talked about larry miller in that interview yeah. somebody at that level uh being given notes uh, i get that it's a client i get all of that but even so uh, being gracious in that situation uh, i'd like to think i'd be okay with it i probably would be yeah would be. Uh, but but you know it, it is so I think you're so fragile as a performer. I don't care how good you you are or how long you've been doing it. Mm -hmm. the The fact that you're a performer it means that somewhere in there, there's a whole bunch of fragile children living in your body, and you are trying to uh, exercise and please those people. And then to have an adult come up and say, "Well, you did it wrong. Here's here's why." I, uh, no, don't talk to me right now. Yeah, this isn't the time. And I, you know, the, the, doing it in private, Ken said that, yep. do it in private. And mm -hmm. that too was like, yes, of course, of course, do it in private. Uh, it, 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 and for those times when I have not done it in private, I apologize to anybody who's listening to this podcast that I have given an opinion about something unsolicited in public. I apologize yeah. right now and I'll never fall into that trap again. Well, we learned. We live, we learn. Yeah. This podcast and, teaches me every time. And I hope that uh, everyone listening to this, if you haven't already, if you have the opportunity in your life before you die to have an actual egg cream made for you that you drink, it is a delightful drink. You can make them at home, which I yeah. think is probably what you're going to have to do in most places that most are places. listening to our podcast. Uh, Switzerland. I'm Switzerland, you, yeah, right yeah. you may have. You have to do this on your own, I would guess. Although well, I've never yes. been to Switzerland, maybe there's egg creams everywhere. There might be a deli in the middle of Bern that you could just exactly. die for. Right. Yeah. I want, but uh, yeah, uh, I I did not. I mean, you tumbled to many things well before I ever have. I get most of what I'm fascinated by and interested in uh, through our friendship. So you were doing egg creams years and years ago because of Harpo Marx. Yes. I didn't tumble to it until President Bartlett on the mm. west wing talked about it and then i was like what the heck is that and so I, I i've been enjoying them ever since all right um next episode we're going to listen to another eli mark story it's one we've heard before <gasps> uh but it's produced in a slightly different way so uh more on that next time but joining us will be yet another magician who fooled Penn and teller and fooled me too the amazing alexandra de vivier 
talking to us all the way from Paris. Nah, that's really cool. Uh, she and her father, Dominique, uh, run Le Double Fond, a magic theater cafe in the heart of Paris. How'd I do there with the uh, French pronunciation? Don't, don't. Uh, I'm going to wait a day before I, I, before I, crit I, want to wait a day before I critique it because I know you're very, very sensitive. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of being uh, at their theater twice. And if you're in Paris, I know there's other stuff to see in Paris. Uh, I guess, but uh, put it on your list to uh, visit Le Double Femme. It's a little bar restaurant with a funky little theater in the basement and some of the best magic you're going to see in Europe. Just uh, Let's just start here. Put put Paris on your list. I, I, I had no idea what a great city that was. You'd think that a man of my sophistication would have tumbled to the fact that Paris was a destination that you should absolutely visit. I went to Paris because I really wanted to go down uh, and see the beaches of Normandy where my uncles and father, I wanted to see that and I could care less about Paris. But once I got to Paris, I was like, holy mackerel, what a town this is. So there, I'm an idiot. You can learn from me. A lot to see and do. Really uh, beautiful. And Le Double Fond is definitely one of the things to see there. So anyway, that's next time we get to chat with the really charming and funny Alexander de Rivier. Uh, for now, be nice to each other, okay? Would you please and enjoy an egg cream and think of us, won't you? This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham, produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.